What's up y'all? It's Dr. Paul with another Golden Age comic book conservation video for Liberty Hill Comics, where I share my passion and over 40 years experience comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. Today we are continuing our video series in which we conserve this Golden Age comic book and prepare it for submission to CGC. In today's video, I'm going to trim the excess Japanese paper from the interior wraps, reinsert the 82-year-old staples into this book, refold and press it, and show you the final results of our conservation, and then it's off to CGC. Our conservation candidate is a copy of Flash Comics number 20 from August 1941, which means it's an early pre-war issue from the first period of the golden age of comic books. It includes stories for three members of the Justice Society of America, Flash, Hawkman, and Johnny Thunder, and has a total of 68 pages. In episode one of this series, we discussed how Flash Comics was the most successful anthology series published by All American Comics, Inc., one of the comic book companies that eventually became the company we know today as DC Comics. Flash Comics was published from January of 1940 through February of 1949, and the first issue famously has the first appearances of three members of the Justice Society of America, The Flash, Hawkman, and Johnny Thunder. Flash Comics number 20 is not a key issue, but being a pre-war Golden Age DC comic book means it will always be in demand as a collectible, and there are only 21 universal copies in the CGC census to meet that market demand, so this copy is definitely worth preserving. We did a walkthrough of the comic book to determine the condition and what flaws it had before developing a conservation plan to address any flaws we could in an effort to maximize the preservation and equity of this comic book. Overall, we decided we had a very solid collectible with great paper quality and only minor soiling. It did suffer from an apparent manufacturing defect that resulted in a rough cut on the top edge and subsequent tears in the first five wraps, as well as a small triangle missing from wrap number six. The cover has a spine split at the bottom of approximately two inches, but by far the greatest flaw we found was that there was an approximately one inch tear on the back cover that had been repaired by gluing the paper back together. This amateur restoration job will rightly get our comic book regarded as restored by CGC with a purple label, and we estimated the grade to be approximately 3.5 to 4.0 restored. Then we presented our game plan to remove the restoration and conserve this comic book to maximize the enjoyment, preservation, and equity. In episode 2, I performed a dry cleaning of this comic book and demonstrated how to use document cleaning powder or a document cleaning pad to remove general light soiling on the surface of the comic book. And I shared my opinion that for removing dinginess from an old Golden Age comic, there really isn't any tool better suited to the job than document cleaning powder. In episode 3... I removed the nearly flawless 82-year-old staples from this comic book so we could separate the cover from the inner wraps and start the process of cleaning, deacidification, glue removal, and tear seals on the cover. I used my standard Golden Age deacidification wash based on the work of paper conservationist Margaret Hayes, and unfortunately we had some ink run during the rinse. I was a little concerned about how much ink fading we would get from that, but I had to push on to the glue removal while the page was still wet, so we wrapped up episode 3 on a bit of a cliffhanger. In episode 4, I removed the amateur glue job on the back cover of the comic and performed a proper archival tear seal with Japanese paper and methyl cellulose adhesive on the spine split and the tear. The original tear was glued with non-archival materials and also was not aligned perfectly, so this work was considered restoration rather than conservation, 
both for the materials used and the amateur nature of the work. The end result was restoration removal and an archival repair of the spine split and tear while retaining the vibrant inks and cover gloss of this 82-year-old Golden Age comic book. In episode 5, I performed an archival tear seal on one of the interior wraps with Japanese paper and methyl cellulose using my preferred method of wetting the entire wrap with calcium hydroxide solution to deacidify the page and ensure that we do not get differential drying or page shrinking during the paper mending process. In episode 6, we did a deep dive on paper manufacturing, the history of photobleaching paper going all the way back to the Middle Ages, why photobleaching works and the chemistry behind it, best practices for using blue LEDs to photobleach comic books, and then we perform some photo bleaching with blue LEDs to decrease the ink bleed on the interior of this 82 year old cover. I've created a playlist for this video series. Check out the link if you missed any of the earlier episodes and want to watch them before we get started today. All right, let's get started. This is the fifth wrap. So in addition to the tear that it had from this poor bindery cut, it also has a tear on the Hawkman story. Look at that Sheldon Maldoff Hawkman, one-third splash. So I repaired this as well. I have a clear ruler and a scalpel. This is a number three handle with a number 11 blade. And I am using a magnifying glass so I'm seeing this at 10x and it's very important to use a clear ruler so that you can perfectly visualize the edge of the page so that you don't cut the 82 year old paper that you're trying to save nor do you leave some Tengujo frayed edges hanging from your work. Now in this area I don't have a straight paper edge, so I'm going to use the ruler as a way to sort of protect the paper, and I'm going to cut around this rough cut and just try to remove the Tengujo in a reasonable fashion. I could attempt to trim that, but I decided against it. This is how it left the manufacturer, and this is how I decided to leave it. Similarly, around this tear out that I believe happened during this rough cut, I'm going to use my scalpel and just carve out the Tengujo and try to leave the frayed edge of the original paper. Use the ruler to pin down the Tengujo here where I need to. And I think that's the best outcome for us on this page that was manufactured in a suboptimal fashion, let's just say, because I'm kind of an optimist. All right, so there's wrap number five. Very happy. Sheldon Maldoff, genius to E.E. E. Hibbard, genius. How sad for All-Star Comics number six. All-Star six is the one where they kicked the flash out for the audacity of having his own title. And Johnny Thunder joins the team. So all these wraps look beautiful. Ink is astonishing, vibrant, really happy. All those repairs are essentially invisible. Of course, the original damage from the printer we've left Again, that's how it left the factory, so I didn't think it was our place to mess with DC Comics output in this regard. Now, here are the rest of the interior wraps. These have not been washed in calcium hydroxide. They didn't have any mending to do, and so I left them. What I'm doing now is I'm going to do a color check. I want to know are the ones I washed noticeably brighter than the ones I didn't? And the answer is no. 
can't tell any difference here. So the first five wraps have been buffered and deacidified. The interior paper beyond that, the rest of the wraps, and this is a big boy. This is early pre-war golden age, so this is 68 pages total. The rest of those wraps, bright white paper, really no need to mess with something that's already that nice. So you'll note the staple holes are essentially filled back in just by the little pulp tabs that get folded in when you do the washing. Staple punctures don't remove paper after all, they just push it out of the way and when you wash it and press it that that paper tends to settle back into that hole. So the wraps are now reunited and I think these wraps have a nice crease to them already and if I use the rest of the interior wraps as a template I think I can just wrap them around and refold this book without doing anything at all fancy. I'm just going to put a little gentle pressure on the spine here and I don't happen to have a bone folder but I think I can use my ruler to good effect here. So I'm going to fix with my right hand where I think that the paper ought to be and then press down on the spine with my left hand. And I think, like I said, a, a ruler will give nice even pressure to help with this refold. And a bone folder would also do the trick here. I, I think in this instance the, the ruler might even be superior because it can push on the entire spine at the same time. And I'm just going to do this until I'm satisfied that those first five wraps are aligned with the rest of the wraps and are folded where I want them to be folded. And I don't mind that I'm going back and forth multiple times here. What could be better than going back and forth between this full splash page by E.E. E. Hibbard and this beautiful cover to All-Star Comics number six by the same artist? So when I'm satisfied that everything is reasonably folded here and aligned, then it'll be time to retrieve the cover the cover is creased fairly well in the original fold, did not have a severe spine roll. Those of you that saw the last video know that I humidified it multiple times and it seems to just want to flop right back to the same fold. So I don't expect a fight from the cover either. In fact, you see that it just drops right into place where we'd like it to. So I think it is time to start working on reinsertion of the staples, but I can't help flipping through the book one last time just to admire how beautiful this paper and these inks are. Gotta love these pre-war DC anthologies. Really top-notch. And I couldn't be more pleased with how beautiful this book is looking so far. So let's get it together. Now we have a bit of a head start in that we haven't messed with the interior 11 wraps. So what I'm going to do is just reinforce the staple holes. I'm going to push this pin in in the same direction that the staple originally pierced the paper. And I'm just going to make sure that all of these wraps are still perfectly aligned, which they tend to stay well aligned when you don't mess with them. But I'm just going to reinforce that here. Having done that, then we can move on to reuniting those 11 wraps with these six wraps, five interior plus the cover. And the first thing I'll attempt is just see if I can't align all of the wraps and pierce them with the pin. This is very gentle work. 
I'm going to see if the pin will slide in with almost no resistance. And if I feel that I need to pierce any paper fibers, I'm going to back off. So I'm not sure if it's not quite aligned properly or if it's just the fact that that pulp filled in on these first five wraps in the cover. So I'm going to just double check the alignment here, top and bottom and left to right, and see if I can't try that one more time. Again, very gently. If it slides in with almost no resistance, I'm good to go. If it offers any resistance at all, I'm not going to force it. We'll find another way. The pin didn't really want to slide in there, so what I'm going to do is remove these top six wraps, again five interior plus the cover. I'm going to make sure that they're perfectly aligned. I'm going to try the same trick, but I'm just going to gently see if the pin doesn't want to just slide through with no resistance. Turns out that works just fine. Sometimes each page just gives a teeny tiny bit of resistance, but six of them stacked up is enough that you just don't want to pierce it because you're not getting the right feedback. The pin isn't wanting to just go in. But now that I've reunited them and preconditioned the first six wraps with the pin, slid right in. So I'm going to leave that pin in place. I have now have a second pin. I'm going to line everything again because with only one pin in place, you still have several degrees of freedom. And we'll try this again. And that also just slid right in. So as I said, we did have a bit of a head start, but this is going swimmingly so far. Of course, I guess I didn't orient this conversation, but we're doing this task to make insertion of the staples easy. Here we can see our staple holes quite clearly on the cover. And again, the barest of pressure, pin slides right in, almost no resistance at all. Lovely. I had, had to use a needle. I ran out of pins for the fourth one. I'm going to retrieve the staples where they have been stored on a piece of painter's tape listed top and bottom with the orientation of top and bottom preserved so that we can put the staples right back exactly where we found them. Now I have the staple and I'm going to grasp it with a pair of forceps and just make sure that the ends of the staple arms are the exact distance apart as my needles to make reinsertion of the staple a dreamy job. And it couldn't have been easier than that. Once we had the needles in the spots where we needed them, the pins and needles, I suppose I should say, and the staple arms the correct distance apart, it just slid right in. No resistance at all. So let's see if we can have as much good luck on the top staple. Again, I'll check the width, and they look a little bit tight here. Those arms are bent in just a little bit. I'm going to bend them out just a tiny bit, double check it. That's more like it. I think that's going to drop right in to those pinholes. So with my left hand, I'll stabilize the paper, pull the pins out with my right hand, and slide the top staple in. That worked beautifully. Now, we did have that head start because the 11 wraps in the middle had never been separated, but I think that's about as smoothly as that operation goes. So you note now I don't need the 10x magnification to do this chore, so I've moved my 
my light ring out of the way. I'm going to use two tools here. I have a block of Delrin with a little hole drilled in it that I use to stabilize the paper. I'm going to stabilize the bottom staple, make sure the upper staple is perfectly vertical, the arms, and then just bend that arm into place with my fingernail and I guide it right into any witness marks that already might be there. When I bend the other arm down, I want to stabilize the paper everywhere. So you see me straddling both the top and the bottom staple here with tools to stabilize them. I'm getting those pins out of my workspace. Double check all the paper alignment before we fix it all in place with this last staple. Bend the staple arm down right into the witness marks. Use the capable staple tool from Immaculate Comics to hold the bent arm in place while bending the last arm down into place and our staples are in. The book is looking like a comic. Time for a final press. Now I did humidify the comic overnight in my humidity chamber. My eighth inch aluminum plate is on my work mat. I have two magazine backer boards plus a sheet of 100 pound cardstock. Here's my comic. I have a buffer for the center fold that is a magazine backer board with cutouts for the staples. I'm just going to stack the comic on my buffer stack. And then I'll have the same buffer stack on the top that is a 100 pound sheet of cardstock toward the paper and then two magazine backer boards. And then I can take my aluminum plate and slide it into my press. I'm going to use my Chinese press here because at 68 pages, these early golden age, the pre-war books are very thick and my seal press to the right there is a lot more work to adjust. And I don't want to press this with too much pressure. So I'm going to use my t-shirt press here, very gentle pressure. And I'm going to run it at 60 centigrade for 199 seconds. That's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit for about just less than 17 minutes. Then I'm going to let it cool overnight. And so this is the next morning. Microman presided over the entire press. And we'll see whether or not he should be fired from his foreman job or whether or not everything went swimmingly. Remove my top buffer stack. Comic looks beautiful. Let's get this aluminum plate out of the way so we can put it right down on our work mat. This is one of those comics that it doesn't dr present here dramatically differently from when we first received it. But the fact is when we received it, it was a restored comic because it had the glue on it and it would have gotten a purple label from CGC when we send it off for grading. Now it should receive a conserved label that's blue with the gray. It's got this beautiful cover gloss, beautiful paper, paper quality is amazing. And I think we did a great job on this one. I'm really pleased with the outcome. Again, we started off with something that would have gotten us a purple label. And being able to just make sure that we don't get a purple label and preserve this one for future generations was what we set out to do. There's that glue job that's been completely removed and repaired with archival techniques using Japanese paper and methylcellulose glue. Let's have a look now at some still images. Here's the back of the book beautifully preserved, vibrant inks, readable, supple, solid, not falling apart, 
wonderful pre-war book. Here's the front cover, and look how beautiful this Golden Age comic book is. I couldn't be more pleased with how this restoration removal and conservation project turned out. Now, it's off to CGC. Thank you for joining me for this video series. We'll wrap it up with a CGC unboxing in the future. Most of the materials I used in this project are available from Amazon. There's a link in the description to my Amazon influencer page as well as individual links for the items if you need any of these materials for your own conservation projects. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to be notified of our next upload. And be sure to check out the Comic Book Conservation Show, which airs live Sunday evenings at 8.35 Eastern, right here on Liberty Hill Comics. Until next time, take care of one another.